You are listening to Feed 44, the official podcast channel of the Center for a Stateless Society. C4SS is an anarchist think tank and media center. For more information, please visit c4ss.org. Governance, Agency, and Autonomy, Anarchist Themes in the Work of Eleanor Ostrom, by Kevin Carson. Center for a Stateless Society, paper number 16, second half of 2013. Introduction. This paper is intended as one in a series to be read along with my previous one on James C. Scott. On anarchists and decentralist thinkers whose affection for the particularity of local human scale institutions overrides any doctrinaire ideological labels. The governance of common pool resources. Ostrom begins by noting the problem of natural resource depletion, what she calls common pool resources, and then goes on to survey three largely complementary, that is, closely related concepts, major theories that attempt to explain the many problems that individuals face when attempting to achieve collective benefits. Hardin's Tragedy of the Commons, The Prisoner's Dilemma, and Olson's Logic of Collective Action. Unfortunately, these models, or this model, ossified into a dogma serving more often as a substitute for thought than a starting point. Even more than 20 years after Ostrom's seminal work, it's still common to state as a truism, backed only by a passing allusion to Hardin or the prisoner's dilemma, that the actual users of resources will inevitably deplete them in the absence of governance by some higher authority or other. Ostrom cites one blithe assertion in an article on fisheries in The Economist. Left to their own devices, fishermen will overexploit stocks. To avoid disaster, managers must have effective hegemony over them. This last quote exemplifies perfectly the common approach to the governance of common pool resources taken by advocates, both of state regulation and corporate privatization. Garrett Hardin himself, later revisiting his article on the tragedy of the commons, argued that the problem of resource depletion would have to be addressed either by a private enterprise system, i.e. ownership by for-profit business firms, or quote-unquote socialism, i.e. ownership and regulation by the state. The assumption that private enterprise and socialism Both require managerial hierarchies of one sort or another and are incompatible with horizontal self-organized institutions speaks volumes about the internalized values of the intellectual stratum. Ostrom goes on to consider the unsatisfactory performance of both the state and the market in addressing the problem. It should be noted right off that the juxtaposition between common property and private property put forward by mainstream capitalist libertarians is just plain silly. In cases where parceling out a common resource to individuals is by the nature of the case impossible, Ostrom says one is hard pressed to understand just what is meant by private. Open fields or common pasture can be divided up into separate plots and distributed to individuals, but fisheries, Common pool resources by the nature of things must be owned and governed by some sort of collective institution, whether it be the state, a corporation, or a self-organized horizontal association of the users themselves. Ownership by a for-profit corporation is no more private than, or if you prefer, just as collectivist as, the administration of a commons by its users. In corporate law, a firm's property is owned and its management employed by a unitary person created under the terms of the corporate charter. No individual shareholder or group of shareholders has any right of ownership over the firm's assets or authority over its management. Both the conventional privatization and state regulation approaches amount when all the legal fictions are stripped away to substituting the judgment of managers working for some absentee central authority perhaps only in theory, working in fact for their own interests, for that of the users. So we might expect it to result 
in the same knowledge and incentive problems that always result from externalizing costs and benefits when ownership and control are divorced from the direct knowledge of the situation. On the other hand, we might expect that placing control directly in the hands of those with Hayekian local knowledge of a situation results in outcomes far preferable to either of the two other two approaches based on verticality and absentee control. And Ostrom's findings bear out this expectation. Rather than starting from the assumption that the users of common resources are helpless without an outside authority intervening to protect them from themselves, she assumes that the capacity of individuals to extricate themselves from various types of dilemma situations varies from situation to situation, and then adopts the empirical approach of surveying, quote unquote, both successful and unsuccessful efforts to escape tragic outcomes. To the two orthodox models of state and corporate ownership, Ostrom juxtaposes the administration of a commons by a binding contract among the commoners themselves to quote unquote, commit themselves to a cooperative strategy that they themselves will work out. Of course, there are ways they could go wrong. Livestock owners can overestimate or underestimate the carrying capacity of the meadow or their monitoring system can break down. But even so, these potential points of failure arguably exist in stronger form in the case of absentee governance by a central institution. The monitoring system is based on the users themselves who are neighbors and who, as users, have a strong incentive to prevent defection by the others, observing each other directly, considerably more effective, one would think, than the typical inspection regime of a state regulatory authority. My mother, who worked in a poultry processing plant and came into daily contact with USDA inspectors, could have told you that. And least, their calculations of carrying capacity and sustainable yield, while fallible, are not dependent on the accuracy of the information obtained by a distant government official or corporate home office, I might add, regarding their strategies. Ostrom's empirical survey casts light not so much on whether such horizontal governance of a commons by the commons themselves works, obviously sometimes it does, but on what particular governance rules produce optimal results. Really, it stands to reason that cooperative governance of common pool resources, all other things being equal, will be more effective in formulating and enforcing rules than governance by either a government agency or a corporation. Because the individuals involved gain a major part of their economic return from the CPRs, they're strongly motivated to try to solve common problems to enhance their own productivity over time. So what remains in the course of Ostrom's investigation is to identify the underlying design principles of the institutions used by those who have successfully managed their own CPRs over extended periods of time. What measures in particular did they take to address the real problems presented by temptations to free ride, shirk, or otherwise act opportunistically? The middle part of her book is accordingly devoted to a survey of field settings in which appropriators have devised, applied, and monitored their own rules to control the use of their CPRs and the resource systems, as well as the institutions, have survived for long periods of time the youngest set of institutions to be analyzed is already more than 100 years old. The history of the oldest system to be examined exceeds 1,000 years. The rules for governing common pool resources in the instances Ostrom examined worked in situations where game theory would have predicted incentives to defect were strong and negative consequences of defection were weak, as in common governance systems for irrigation waters in the Spanish Philippines where monitoring was relatively weak and fines were low compared to the benefits of defection. And stealing water in a drought might save an entire season's crop. And far from reflecting an anachronistic holdover from the past, governance systems for common pool resources have typically reflected close empirical reasoning from historical experience. In the case of communal for pastoral mountain land, for at least Five centuries, these Swiss villagers 
have been intimately familiar with the advantages and disadvantages of both private and communal tenure systems and have carefully matched particular types of land tenure to particular types of land use. Based on her survey, Ostrom distilled this list of common design principles from the experience of successful governance institutions. One, clearly defined boundaries. Individuals or households who have rights to withdraw resource units from the CPR must be clearly defined, as must the boundaries of the CPR itself. Congruence between appropriation and provision rules and local conditions. This is two. Appropriation rules restricting time, place, technology, and or quantity of resource units are related to local conditions and to provision rules requiring labor, material, and or money. Three, collective choice arrangements. Most individuals affected by the operational rules can participate in modifying the operational rules. Four, monitoring. Monitors who actively audit common pool resource conditions and appropriator behavior are accountable to the appropriators or are the appropriators themselves. Five, graduated sanctions. Appropriators who violate operational rules are likely to be assessed graduated sanctions depending on the seriousness and context of the offense by other appropriators, by officials accountable to these appropriators, or by both. Six, conflict resolution mechanisms. Appropriators and their officials have rapid access to low-cost local arenas to resolve conflicts among appropriators or between appropriators and officials. Seven, minimal recognition of rights to organize. The rights of appropriators to devise their own institutions are not challenged by external governmental authorities. Eight, nested enterprises. Appropriation, provision, monitoring, enforcement, conflict resolution, and governance activities are organized in multiple layers of nested enterprises. Here are some thoughts that occurred to me as I read through Ostrom, Ostrom's common principles. Historically, many commons governance regimes have failed as a result of outside interference by states and landed elites. With the spirit of number seven, that was true of both Stalipin's reform and Stalin's forced collectivization, which both ran roughshod over the mere's internal rights of self-governance. In addition, Stalipin its land policy in its substance violated number one by allowing individual households in withdrawal aliquot shares of land from the village common fields as a close in English terms, as a close in English terms, without the consent of the mirror as a whole. In so doing, it violated the basic social understanding of the nature of property ownership built into the systems from its founding. To put it in terms understandable by the kind of right-wing libertarian who would instinctively cheer for the word private and booze common, imagine if a legislature override the terms of a corporate charter and let individual shareholders barge into factories with front-end loaders and carry off some aliquot share of machinery under the terms of the charter owned solely by the corporation as a single person from assembly lines. Imagine how that would disrupt production planning within a factory. That's what Stolipin's policies did to land use planning by the mere for those lands remaining within the open fields. Number three, the right of those affected by the rules to have a say in devising them is normative theories of participatory democracy aside, a prerequisite for an efficiently functioning institution. As Ostrom says, Common pool resource institutions that use this principle are better able to tailor their rules to local circumstances because the individuals who daily interact with one another and with the physical world can modify the rules over time so as to better fit them to the specific characteristics of their setting. The separation of decision-making power from both distributed situational knowledge and experience of the consequences is key to all the knowledge and incentive problems of hierarchical authoritarian institutions, whether they be governments or corporations. 
top-down authority is a mechanism for expropriating the benefits of others' work for oneself and externalizing cost and inconvenience downward. Given the obvious knowledge and incentive problems resulting from the separation of authority from competence, why is hierarchy ever adopted in the first place? The answer lies in clearing our minds of unconscious assumptions that institutional design is something that we or society do in order to maximize some vague idea of the common good. Hierarchy exists because those who run the dominant institutions of state and corporation have both a fundamental conflict of interest with those who possess the situational knowledge such that the former cannot trust the latter to use their own best judgment. The manager of a hierarchical institution, like the owner of a slave plantation, cannot trust her subordinates to use their own best judgment lest she find her throat cut in the middle of the night. And subordinates know full well that if they use their situational knowledge to maximize efficiency, any productivity gains will be expropriated by management in the form of downsizings, speed-ups, and management bonuses. Most production jobs involve a fair amount of hidden or distributed knowledge and depend on the initiative of workers to improvise to apply skills in new ways. In the face of events which are either totally unpredictable or cannot be fully anticipated, rigid hierarchies and rigid work rules only work in a predictable environment. When the environment is unpredictable, the key to success lies with empowerment and autonomy for those in direct contact with the situation. The problem with authority relations in a hierarchy is that given the conflict of interest created by the presence of power, those in authority cannot afford to allow discretion to those in direct con contact with the situation. Systematic stupidity results of necessity from a situation in which a bureaucratic hierarchy must develop some metric for assessing the skills or work quality of a labor force whose actual work they know nothing about and whose material interests militate against remedying management's ignorance. When management doesn't know, in Paul Goodman's words, what a good job of work is, they are forced to rely on arbitrary metrics. Weberian work rules are necessary because those at the top of the pyramid cannot afford to allow those at the bottom the discretion to use their own common sense because the subordinate has a fundamental conflict of interest with the superior and does not internalize the benefits of applying her intelligence. She cannot be trusted to use her intelligence for the benefit of the organization. In such a zero-sum relationship, any discretion can be abused. On the other hand, subordinates cannot afford to contribute to the knowledge necessary to design an efficient work process. R.A. Wilson's analogy of the person in authority confronting the subordinate as a highwayman is a good one. The party with residual claimancy in any economic institution, like a business firm, will use the powers associated with ownership to obtain a disproportionate share of the surplus. Those who lack ownership stakes will have a corresponding incentive to underinvest their knowledge and skills in the performance of the enterprise. Hence, the most rational approach to maximizing productivity is to assign, assign residual claimancy or ownership rights to stakeholders in accordance with their contribution to productivity. This almost never happens because it's in management's perceived self-interest to engage in self-dealing even at the expense of the overall productivity of the firm. So workers instead hoard knowledge and minimize their legibility, in James Scott's terms, to management and minimize the chance that the increased productivity resulting from their hidden knowledge will be used against them or expropriated. Hence, hierarchies are a very inefficient way of organizing activity from the standpoint of harnessing the full capabilities and knowledge of the workforce. But when given a choice between efficiency and control, between a larger pie and a larger slice of a smaller pie, management usually prefers to maximize the size of their slice rather than the size of the pie. Hierarchy is a way of organizing human activity so as to facilitate the extraction of rents from it, even at the expense of a severe degradation in efficiency. Monitoring systems, number four, are best designed when actors most concerned with cheating 
are placed in direct contact with one another. For example, in an irrigation rotation system, the actor whose turn it, it currently is is prevented from extending their turn past its scheduled end by the presence of the actors whose turn is next, eagerly waiting to take over. Grandma's practice of letting one child cut the cake in half and the other take first pick is the classic example of this principle. In many cases, monitoring others' use of a commons is a natural byproduct of using the commons, and successful monitoring is further encouraged by informal sanctions and rewards, sometimes as simple as the social approval or disapproval of one's neighbors. The cost of frontline supervision is generally about a quarter as much in the plywood uh, cooperatives of the Pacific Northwest as it is in conventional capitalist operations because of employee self-monitoring. Under graduated sanctions, the modest penalties actually serve as a mutual confidence building regime. Users who enter into a governance system suspicious their neighbors will violate the rules and thus having an incentive to defect themselves will on being detected and paying a modest penalty, be reassured that enforcement is credible, compliance is widespread, and they can expect to benefit rather than being taken advantage of by participating in the system. There will always be a small minority, of course, who are immune to such moral sanctions, but the majority of whom such sanctions do work will reduce the cost of monitoring those who need closer surveillance. Ostrom also considers the optimal conditions for overcoming the transaction costs of incrementally improving on a common pool resource governance system. She starts with the assumption that appropriators are in a remote location under a political regime that is basically indifferent to what happens with regard to CPRs of this type, and therefore unlikely to interfere either to promote or impede local governance decisions. Under such conditions, the likelihood of common pool resource appropriators adopting a series of incremental changes in operational rules to improve joint welfare will be positively related to the following internal characteristics. One, most appropriators share a common judgment that they will be harmed if they do not adopt an alternative rule. Two, most appropriators will be affected in similar ways by the proposed rule changes. Three, most appropriators highly value the continuation activities from this common pool resource. Four, appropriators face relatively low information, transformation, and enforcement costs. Five, most appropriators share generalized norms of reciprocity and trust that can be used as initial social capital. Six, the group appropriating from the common pool resource is relatively small and stable. In other words, the same conditions under which Ostrom's earlier list of eight prerequisites for successful common pool resource governance are likely to be met in the first place. As we shall see in the next section, states have exacerbated problems by artificially inflating the extent of background conditions, e.g. large anonymous market areas, with one-off dealings, social atomization, etc., in which Ostrom's prerequisites for successful self-governance do not exist. The existence of an interventionist state can hamper formation of local common pool resource governance regimes in another way, even when intentions are good. When locals in an area without common pool resource governance regimes already in place are aware of a central government with an interest in regulating common pool resources, the temptation will be greatly increased to wait and see in hopes of free riding off a central government regulatory policy. And of course, the difficulty faced by officials from a central government in obtaining sufficient knowledge of local conditions to formulate governance rules as effective as those designed by local appropriators in direct contact with local conditions, and the constant temptation to devise uniform policies for all jurisdictions will impede good governance. You've been listening to Feed 44, the official podcast channel of the Center for a Stateless Society. C4SS is an anarchist think tank and media center. For more information, please visit c4ss.org.